Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel, where we bring modern medicine to strength and conditioning and strength and conditioning to modern medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, and we are back. I got a new white coat, uh, got some motivation, and so what I've done is created a bunch of content that's gonna be coming out every Tuesday here on the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to our channel to get all the latest updates, make sure you like the video, and also we wanna hear what you wanna see next on this channel. So you can leave that in the comments below. We really love hearing from you. What are we talking about today? hernias. Let's not waste any time. Let's dig into this. Hernia is uh, when an organ or part of an organ or tissue abnormally protrudes through the wall of the cavity that's normally contained in, such as when a loop of bowel gets pushed through a weak point in the abdominal wall fascia. This weak point creates a defect in the fascia, which is basically a band or sheet of connective tissue. It's primarily collagen uh, that's beneath the skin and attaches, stabilizes, and closes and separates muscles and other organs. All right, next up, how are hernias named? And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because people read this diagnosis and they're like, well, what the heck does that mean? So hernias are typically classified by location and or cause. For example, hernias that develop from a prior surgical incision are called incisional hernias. Uh, those that don't uh, result from a surgical incision are called primary or acquired hernias. They're also named by location. So ventral hernias, which occur anteriorly on the ventral side of the body can be epigastric in the epigastric gastric area or umbilical in the um, region of the umbilicus, etc. Uh, similarly, groin hernias uh, occur in the lower region of the abdomen, the groin, where the thigh meets the hip. And there are two major types, femoral and inguinal. Inguinal occurs along the inguinal canal, typically above, whereas femoral uh, hernias occur typically below the inguinal canal. Uh, there are many other types of hernias, but we're gonna focus on inguinal hernias in this video. Um, one other thing to say, sometimes the complications also make their way into the naming of the hernia, or you might hear people describe these different terms, such as reducible, basically meaning you can push the hernia back in through the defect in the cavity uh, that it normally was enclosed in, or an incarcerated hernia, which basically means the hernia is trapped and it cannot be reduced, which causes reduced blood flow. Also strangulation, uh, which basically leads to uh, ischemia or lack of blood flow and necrosis or death of the contents of the hernia. Next up, who gets an inguinal hernia? Uh, so this is super common. Approximately 5 million Americans, about 5 to 10% of the population, have a hernia. The majority of these hernias are located in the groin. 96% of them are inguinal hernias, which again is the subject of this video. Uh, this typically results in about 700,000 surgical repairs each year in the United States, and it's the third most common reason for people to go see their doctor. All right, next up, getting to the meat of this. How do you know if you have a hernia? So about two thirds, 66% of hernias are symptomatic, meaning that you're gonna have a dull, uh, vague pain, usually in the lower groin or lower abdomen region. On the other hand, if you have moderate to severe pain that comes on with the quickness, it still could be due to a hernia, but probably not just your run of the mill hernia, but perhaps it's incarcerated or strangulated and that warrants emergent sort of evaluation from a physician. Uh, if it comes on quickly and it's not due to a hernia, it could also also be testicular torsion, epididymitis, hydrocele, varicocele, a bunch of other different uh, medical conditions that again, need to be worked up by a doctor. And so if two thirds are symptomatic, that means that one third are asymptomatic or without symptoms, but typically there's a bulge uh, that is present and that you can see and that the physician will be able to see. Uh, and typically that will be reducible, again, that you can actually push the uh, contents of the hernia back through the wall where it was herniated from. Um, this is diagnosed via physical examination and physical exam is actually pretty good at picking this stuff up. So it's 75% sensitive, all right, and 96% specific. Those are pretty good odds. Typically you have the patient standing uh, and actively coughing or doing a Valsalva maneuver and should see a bulge above or below the inguinal ligament crease. So above is typically an inguinal hernia and below is typically a femoral hernia. <laughs> Now the real reason why you all are here, what causes a hernia? 
So there are a handful of things that we have a high degree of evidence for. So thing one, inheritance. So basically if you have a first degree relative that's been diagnosed with an inguinal hernia, that increases the likelihood that you will get an inguinal hernia. Gender also, we've kind of discussed this before. Uh, this is way more common in men, about eight times, and they're you know 20 times more likely to need a surgical repair. Age also appears to be a risk factor for developing an inguinal hernia. And there appears to be this like uh, bimodal distribution, meaning there's one signal, one peak, uh, very early age, about five years old, and then the next biggest peak occurs uh, when individuals are much older, 60 to 74 years old. Now, it does appear to increase over time as individuals get older and older. So individuals that are 24 to 39 uh, tend to have a lower risk than individuals who are 40 to 59. And that, again, keeps increasing 60 to 74 and 75 plus. Other things that increase risk of inguinal hernias that we have high levels of evidence for. Uh, so connective tissue disorders, typically these are inherited. Uh, if you have prostate surgery history, specifically prostatectomy, so removal of the prostate, either complete or partial. And there are a handful of things that may increase risk, although we don't really have great evidence for them. So race may play a role. Um, inguinal hernias are significantly less common among black adults, uh, for example. Chronic constipation may also increase uh, inguinal hernia risk, although the data is not great. Now, a few of you are probably scratching your heads thinking, hey, didn't you miss a few things like obesity? Don't individuals with obesity have higher risks of inguinal hernia development? Because we know that uh, obesity or excess adiposity tends to be a risk factor for many different things. Uh, however, in this case, it actually appears that um, excess adiposity or individuals with obesity, it might actually be protective. Uh, in any case, the data appears pretty clear that uh, ec you know individuals uh, who are overweight or who are obese tend to have lower incidences of uh, inguinal hernias. Another thing you'll notice that I didn't say increased risk of inguinal hernia is tobacco use. Um, again, if you asked doctors just in the street, hey, what increases risk of any disease? Most of the time they're gonna say, excess uh, adipose tissue or obesity. Uh, and then the next thing is gonna be smoking or some semblance of that. Fortunately, right now, the data actually suggests that uh, tobacco use is not a risk factor for developing inguinal hernias. In fact, there's some evidence showing it may reduce the risk. I'm not advising anybody to go start using tobacco because I don't think that data is very clear, but the data is what it is right now. And it doesn't appear that individuals who use tobacco have any higher risk of developing an inguinal hernia. Now, let's get to the good stuff. The real reason that you guys are here at the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel is because you wanna know, does lifting actually increase the risk of inguinal hernia development? Like when your mom said, if you keep lifting those heavy weights, you're gonna get a hernia. Or maybe, maybe that was just my family, but uh, that is a question that we get all the time. And so I dug into the research and there's a few different lines of converging evidence that all suggest, eh, probably not. So thing one, Inguinal hernia development is typically not due to a single event. In fact, the study I've linked in the description below is titled, it is highly unlikely that the development of an abdominal wall hernia can be attributable to a single strenuous event. Uh, and effectively, I'll read the exact quotation. We conclude that we are unable to find any clinical evidence to support the hypothesis that a hernia might develop as the result of one single strenuous or traumatic event. While we accept that this mechanism might still possibly occur, we believe that at best it is extremely uncommon. So what that means is that it's unlikely that a single event like lifting a heavy single on a squat or a deadlift or doing a heavy set or hard workout increases your risk acutely of developing that inguinal hernia because again, these things don't occur from a single event based on the present evidence. So while many people might agree that, yeah, it's probably not due to this single event, what it's really due to is the cumulative effect, the cumulative stress that you're imparting on your body from all this heavy lifting, particularly if because you have to hold your breath because you're doing a valsalva maneuver. So the valsalva maneuver is when you fill up your lungs with air. So the lungs expand, the diaphragm goes down and imparts some pressure in the abdominal cavity because the diaphragm goes down. You're contracting your abs, which limits how far the internal organs can go forward. So you create increased intra-abdominal pressure. You also, also get increased intra-thoracic pressure because you're not letting that air escape. Basically you've closed your glottis. So you have increased intra-thoracic pressure up here and increased intra-abdominal pressure down there. The idea is all this increase in pressure is going to cumulatively cause a defect in the fascia, a defect in the musculature, something like that, that's gonna cause you to have a hernia. So let's take a look at what the data says. 
it doesn't appear that cumulative intra-abdominal pressure increases the risk of developing an inguinal hernia. So to better answer this question, we could look at this Danish study where they took 18,000 men, followed them for about 18 years to see if there was any correlation between the hours spent per day standing, walking, or lifting loads greater than 20 kilos. Now, if there was an issue with this cumulative intra-abdominal stress, uh, what you would expect to see is way greater uh, incidence of inguinal hernias in those who spent the most time lifting loads greater than 20 kilos, right? However, there was no significant difference in inguinal hernia cases between those who lifted the most weight per day and those who didn't lift at all. In fact, the only significant relationship that was found uh, was that those individuals who were standing for greater than six hours per day had a 45% higher risk of having to have surgery to repair an inguinal hernia than those who were standing for less than four hours per day. But there was no association found with amount of load lifted or frequency of load lifted. So that all suggests that lifting probably doesn't increase the risk of developing a hernia. Rather, the things that we referred to earlier, particularly the things that have high levels of evidence that they increase inguinal hernia risk. So uh, inheritance, that familial predisposition, um, sex, so again, males tend to have a much higher risk of developing inguinal hernia than women do. Age, that bimodal distribution that we talked about, connective tissue disorders, uh, surgical history, specifically prostatectomy. Um, those things probably contribute much, much more than any sort of, uh, sort of lifting-based risk. All right, so now we get to talk about treatment. If you have an inguinal hernia, what do? If you're concerned that you have a hernia based on symptoms and or the presence of a bulge, you should be evaluated by a physician for diagnosis and management. Go get it checked out. Don't listen to me here on the internet uh, to diagnose you. But if you get diagnosed, what can you expect? So from a treatment standpoint, most inguinal hernias are symptomatic and the definitive cure for a symptomatic groin hernia is surgery. Asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic male inguinal hernia patients may choose to use this watchful waiting approach since the risk of uh, hernia related emergencies is relatively low. Now there are some risks, so like complications of the hernia, the symptoms could worsen and there may be a need for emergent surgery, but again, that's relatively low. So basically a shared decision between the physician and the patient based on the preferences, risks, the individual case uh, and all that sort of stuff should be undertaken. So if you do need surgery, uh, mesh repair is recommended as the first choice. Um, and the surgery can be performed by a number of different ways, which depends on the surgeon, their expertise, the patient and hernia related characteristics um, and complications, uh, the anatomy, and also the resources. Uh, right now, one standard repair technique for all groin hernias does not exist. All right, you just had hernia repair surgery and you're trying to get back to lifting, what do? Uh, so unfortunately, most surgeons' recommendations for physical activity restrictions uh, are not evidence-based and they have the potential to greatly affect physical activity participation in their patients. The existing data on inguinal hernia repair indicates that most activities can be resumed within three to five days for those undergoing elective inguinal hernia repair. And in fact, when you look at the 2018 International Guidelines for Hernia Management, they actually say a period of rest or a lifting restriction is not necessary after an inguinal hernia operation. Patients can do what they feel capable of doing. So your surgeon may give you different advice and it's up to you to advocate for your own health and ask questions as to why, because there might have been a complication or a particular procedure used that increases your risk. Um, and then also just be upfront about what you're planning on doing and try to come up with this sort of shared decision-making plan with them. But that's what the data says. That's what the current guidelines are. So at least you have a few talking points to initiate that conversation. And again, hopefully come up with a shared plan going forward. All right, that's a wrap on this video. Again, make sure you subscribe to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. We'll be here every Tuesday. Every Monday, we drop a new podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Wednesday, you can join me over on my Instagram page, Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine. I do an Instagram live. So if you wanna ask questions, we're there every Wednesday night, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we post a new article over on the Barbell Medicine website, barbellmedicine.com, every Friday. So we've got loads of content coming at you. So check us out across these platforms if you want to stay up to date on all the latest nuance in the health and fitness world. We'll see you next time here on the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. See you.